Hi, I'm Naresh, and uh, welcome to the second ever DNAD Dinner With, which is a series of conversations with fantastic creative leaders who are offering inspiring perspectives and practical advice to next generation creative talent uh, and to all generations of creative talent. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Naresh. Uh, so, Pablo, I've used um, a few words to describe you uh, creative director, content director, satirist. Uh, what, what word would you use to describe yourself? Yeah, um, that's a tricky one. I, I don't feel like I've ever nailed down exactly what I do in a specific word or title. Um, I started my career in advertising in an agency. And so art director feels like the best fitting. Like I design and communicate through visual language and I like deciding which visuals to use. And so art direction makes sense. And then I guess I just call myself a creative director because I have my own place and I can call myself whatever I want. And <laughs> I thought a creative director is a pretty cool title. And uh, so I gave that to myself. Very good. Um, so uh, let's go back to before you were a creative director to the beginnings of your career. Um, and let's, um, and what starter have you got for us, um, Pablo? So share something that you did or a couple of things you did at the beginning of your career that helped you get your first break and find your voice. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think the examples I've picked out today aren't necessarily things that gave me a big break, but there are projects that I did in the pursuit of where I'm at right now. So basically in the spirit of doing um, fun, creative content and silly things um, for the internet, um, I wanted to share some stuff that people may not have seen before, um, but there are projects that I do with friends and um, I still like to see them every once in a while and thought it'd be fun to share today. So I guess I would start with the underwater burrito. One of my favorite foods. <laughs> this is an example of just something that is completely ridiculous, but I think it's important for me to um, have a ridiculous idea and actually do it. I think that's kind of what brought me to where I am now. It's just doing what other people may not be willing to do in terms of executing on what may seem like just a really silly idea. And so um, I don't know what kind of mood I was in this day, but um, this was a couple of years ago and I decided to post on Facebook. If this post gets 200 likes, I will eat an entire burrito underwater. Um, I'm not sure if I had the idea of eating the burrito underwater first or trying to get a bunch of likes first, but Anyways, it felt like something that if I were to post this, this would be something that I would like to see on Facebook personally, something that's completely from left field. And so I posted this and I'm never at this point, I had never gotten more than maybe 100 likes on something. And so having 200 likes sounded something really exciting to me. And so, you know, lo and behold, the next day I had 200 likes because people really wanted to see me eat a burrito underwater, which I had never done before. So obviously disgusting. Um, it's nothing that you would expect to see on Facebook. Um, and uh, I know this is a dinner talk, so this is probably really unappetizing for everyone, but- uh, like, like a shark attack. Yeah, I know it's, and it was uh, something, I, something I learned actually was that you can't really swallow underwater or food. <laughs> I don't know what the physics are behind it, but I couldn't actually, so it was just kind of in my mouth. It, it was, I won't go into details, but, the point is that I was doing before where I am right now in my career, I was always doing kind of silly things, even as an adult, like things that maybe like a teenage uh, kid would be expected to do, but I just continued to do it throughout my whole career. And I continue to do this day. And I think that's what makes me um, who I am right now in my career, which is someone who's like, I take silly ideas very seriously in that if I were to, if I execute on a silly, um, out of, out of the box idea, um, that's the kind of content that people actually enjoy watching on the internet. And so, um, that's an example of me doing it before, um, where I am now. And of course, that's nothing a client would ever ask me to do, but if I do enough of these, um, fun experiments online, um, I eventually find my own voice and find things that work and um, get the attention of brands who may eventually commission me to do fun, creative work for them. Mm -hmm. 
Fantastic. What, what, and, what, and where is this in your career then? Is this when you were at Goodby? Is this a side project? Is it when you were at Tinder? I think so. It might have been right after Goodby. Um, yeah, it's around that time. I wasn't doing my own studio or doing my own work on Instagram. Um, this was just me wanting to have fun and um, wanting to like really throw a curveball at the people who my friends on Facebook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and you describe it. I've seen, I've, I've read or seen you describe yourself as a, an entertainer and uh, clearly entertainment's really, really important to you. And um, you can see it there and you can see it in so much of your work. And uh, uh, why is that? What, what, what is it about entertainment that you want to give to people? What? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, I think my goal really is to entertain people. Um, I think a lot of it is getting a reaction from people. Um, mm -hmm. I think we all want attention and I feel like the, uh, I get a lot of joy from having a creative idea and then seeing other people react to it, um, whether they laugh or smile or get inspired. Um, it's something that personally, like the best times, the most like happiest and the best times of my life are with, with, I'm with my friends or family or girlfriend, and we're just like laughing and enjoying the moment. And so if I can create that for other people, whether it's through an underwater burrito or a creative client project, um, if I can just make someone smile or laugh for maybe a couple seconds, um, yeah, that's really, it's kind of hard to beat that doing anything else. So it's like light, lightning life a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you've got your um, mechanism there of um, 200 likes and then you'll do something. It's like a dare, a dare um, or a forfeit. Um, and it, and obviously technology is, um, you know, it's a, it's a big part of your work. You're sort of playing with it, using its, um, using bits of interface, sort of interacting with it, sort of debunking it. Um, have you always been interested in technology as a subject? Um, and are you anti? Uh, is your work anti-technology or is it pro-technology? So I can read it. Yeah, both. I'm not sure really if it's anti-pro. I don't have a strong stance. I mean, I'm, I have the latest iPhone. I have, I love my AirPods. I love a lot of the products that I end up making fun of. Um, maybe it has to do with a little bit about being in San Francisco where all this technology is happening. Yeah. And, um, you know, technology is thriving and it's kind of fun to poke at things that are doing really well and people are spending a lot of money on, um, you know, it's just good fodder. Everyone gets excited about the latest technology, but then that's something great that it's great material for me to twist and poke fun at. Um, yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, did you have another starter project you wanted to share as well? Yeah, sure. I, uh, have another one. Let's do the pogo horn. So this is a project I do uh, with my friend Graham at Goodby. Um, this is another silly idea that we had. I forget, maybe Graham had it or I had it or we both had it. But uh, anyways, we did this together. And uh, the idea was to put a horn on a pogo stick and uh, jump up and down making a terrible noise um, in the neighborhood. And that was it. It was just like, uh, okay, if we made this thing and uh, I think the idea was to eventually like create a marketplace where we could sell dumb products like this. Um, but that's, this is another thing that's, uh, we're doing something ridiculous idea that doesn't make sense, but we're making it anyways because we think it's going to be entertaining for people to watch. And it's just fun for us to make um, regardless. And so it's just another example of having a silly idea and actually going to do it. I think that's kind of, um, I feel like that's my job is to um, take silly ideas seriously because mm -hmm. a lot of the fun, entertaining content that we see out in the world is the result of that, is the result of people going out and uh, spending an entire day doing something that really makes no sense. But once it's out, once the video is produced and we get to post it and share it with the friends, even if we just text the video to a couple of friends and only get a couple of reactions, it's like worth it. Um, yeah. It's like that feeling if you know, I'm sure we're all like, we've been in a group chat before and uh, you send like the perfect meme or the perfect gif or uh, a fun joke. 
and everyone goes, ha, 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 ha. Like you feel like there's a satisfaction in providing entertainment value to your friends. And so um, we knew we could probably achieve that, if not more, if we were posting online. And so it's the same feeling I get right now when I post them in Instagram and um, people are enjoying it. Um, it's a good feeling. You, you make your um, ideas in, in the way you execute them, you make them come out very effortlessly. They seem very, um, you know, very instinctively create, uh, executed. And uh, there's a good question from um, Chitan here in the audience, which is, um, do you, is, is that actually how it is? Do you actually, do you have creative blocks and do you, and how do you overcome them? Yeah, no, it's a really good question because I don't really, I don't even really show my face, let alone the behind the scenes of what I do on online or on an Instagram account. And um, there is a lot of struggle behind the scenes. I mean, I'm not going to post, I don't post the bad ideas I have and I have hundreds of bad ideas like all the time, you know? So um, yeah, a lot of the hard work is actually making it look effortless, which is yeah. kind of a weird counterintuitive thing and um but i think that's what brings entertainment value something that just feels like it just happened like naturally just like a stream of consciousness or uh improv an improvised joke in a conversation there's something in the moment that feels uh uh that has a little bit more value than something that feels um has been worked over like too much um, but the funny thing is that a lot of the work that I do that feels effortless, is just like one shot on my iPhone. I didn't even control the lighting, but if you look at my camera roll, there's like hundreds of these videos of the same thing, me trying to capture the right thing. And oftentimes I am overthinking something. Um, mm, mm. and, uh, but the, I've found that the struggle is worth it to get to a place where there is an idea that, um, works it is it is a contradiction really that i work so much on something that seems effortless um but it turns out that the effortlessness of something is what um attracts people and definitely. to it definitely i totally agree yeah and so the creative block is so real like i was feeling that yesterday i feel it all the time and uh i feel maybe a I hope that people don't think this is easy for me because it's not, um, it is fun. There's a lot of, wait, I feel like super lucky to even be doing this because there's a lot of like almost every other job is more difficult in some sense. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of time and effort behind something that seems effortless. So, um, sure. yeah, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't come easy. Uh, we've got lots of questions coming in and I'll hold some of them for the main course section. Um, but a couple that I think are relevant for you at the beginning is uh, um, how did you get into internet culture? I mean, you touched upon that a little bit. Um, this is from Ali because your virtual vernacular is so on point. Um, completely agree. And then um, from Elizabeth Rose with the effortless question about you, you know, going through lots of iterations to um, create something that's um, very, very simple and straightforward. How do you know what a brand, how do you know what a bad idea is? Um, how do you know when you've had one? So internet culture and bad idea, maybe you can answer that and then we can go on to the main course. Yeah, internet culture. Well, first of all, I spent a lot of time online. So I'm kind of just um, from the result of just like being a sponge of the internet. Um, it kind of seeps into my work naturally in a sense where uh, I get inspired by things on the internet. And so the output is, inherently has that feeling of being very much of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a part of me that feels really lucky that personally, I'm very like impatient and um, with like production. And so I just want to make things kind of fast. And the result of that is a, like a lo-fi aesthetic that is uh, the aesthetic of the internet. I mean, the most, popular videos on the internet are often just shot on your phone with like the lighting is not considered. It's just a moment in time in someone's day, like the Charlie bit my finger video or, mm -hmm. um, you know, these videos are getting just as much attention and giving people just as much value as like a high, highly produced uh, TV commercial or comedy skit that someone makes. And yeah, um, 
there's definitely amazing content that's being made in a more high production way. But in terms of my wanting to just move on to the next thing, naturally, like even before the internet, I feel like that's how I was as a maker anyways, just wanted to make something, get it out, go to the next thing. The result of that is kind of a lo-fi aesthetic that is um, kind of a good fit for the internet because, um, you know, when we make something, uh, whether it's with a client or just on our own and we post it online, it's showing up in the same feed as uh, your friend's selfie or a video of their baby or uh, a food pic, just like it's literally you're up against literally someone with their phone. And so in a sense, having something that's high production kind of doesn't feel a part of what's happening in the feed. So, I totally yeah, agree. To an extent, because, but then there's also the, an argument you can make that adding a little bit more production value makes you stand out and makes someone pay attention more. So there's that balance between like matching the, the vibe of what's going on in your feed and um, introducing something new. But in terms of the internet aesthetic, it just happens to be something that matches the way I work, which is like, I don't want to spend time making things perfect. I don't want to spend, take too much of someone else's time. Like I only spend a couple seconds with each piece of content that I um, encounter on the internet. And so I don't want to expect my audience to, to spend more than that on my content. Yeah. And, and lots of people are now asking um, the same question Elizabeth asked about how, well, uh, how do you know when you've had a, it's when it's a good idea and when it's a bad idea, how do you know that? Yeah. I mean, it comes a lot from just publishing a lot. Um, and getting a reaction. Um, I talk about the delete button a lot when I'm talking to uh, people because I think being able to delete something is like really comforting to me. Like I can post something and if it's not getting the amount of engagement I thought it would it could get or mm-hmm. I want it to get, then I'll just take it down. I don't want to waste people's time. And so right. I really don't know if something's going to work until it's in front of people. And um, that's okay if it doesn't work, I can take it down. But then also I've just been posting a bunch in the past couple of years. And so I kind of get a sense of what's working, what's not working. What's your takedown to keep up ratio? Um, now it's, it's a lot less, honestly. Um, I kind of, I guess recently I've, I've set the bar higher for myself in terms of wanting to post uh, more quality than quantity. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, recently I haven't deleted that much, but, um, I think I'm deleting it before I even post in a sense, like I have a notebook full of ideas and I'm writing ideas all the time. And then I intentionally write down bad ideas. It's just a process of mine that I think that getting out the bad ideas on paper, they, uh, don't linger in my head and I can move on to the next opportunity to have another insight or idea. So the editing process or the deleting of a bad idea happens sometimes before the post. Yeah. 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 Well, I have to say you're straight. You're, I think part of the reason I really wanted to um, meet you is I think the strike rate is really, really high. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> it's just a real pleasure going through your Instagram and going, yep, that's great. Yep. That's great. Yep. That's great. So your process <laughs> is, your process is working. I wonder if we should um, move into the main course part and then we can take some more questions. So this is um, the main course is about, is you picking some projects that are sort of defining you uh, have defined or are defining you in terms of your career. So what are you going to share with us? Um, let's share the pigeon video. Cause I feel like that's something that's really kind Love of popped pigeon. off. Love the pigeon. <laughs> Thank you. I actually just posted another one this morning. Um, I keep coming back to them because they keep uh, delivering, honestly. Fantastic. Uh, Radina and Elizabeth both asked a little earlier, uh, a pigeon's hard to work with. What's it like working with the pigeon community? And I, I would just throw into that why pigeons as well. Yeah. 
Okay, so I live in uh, San Francisco, and there are a ton of pigeons around, just like I would assume most major cities have pigeons or some kind of birds that are always hanging out. And um, uh, I live in North Beach, which is close to Chinatown, where I shot that um, pigeon poster video. And, you know, a lot of these, like every other idea, it comes from an insight or an inkling that there is a opportunity to make something fun and so with pigeons i know that they're often overlooked they're kind of like considered kind of like rats like no one wants them around or they're kind of rejected so that kind of thing is the perfect thing for me to play with because i do like playing with what's in front of everyone's eyes but no one's really paying attention to so shining a new light on something is something i enjoy doing and so with the pigeons so basically it starts with a feeling that I could do something with pigeons. Like I'm walking down the street and I see a pigeon eating something. Um, they're gathering around something and I say, okay, there's something I can do with it. And so my creative process will start with me going to my notebook and saying, giving myself a brief um, saying, Hey, write down 10 ideas about pigeons. Like what could you do with a pigeon? And um, the thinking starts with, uh, okay, what do pigeons do? Like, what are the, what's the actual mechanics of this bird? Um, they'll eat pretty much anything. They come in like, uh, they like flock to just any type of food around. And so that thinking leads to like, what can I, what food can I put where to make them do something unexpected? And so then I'll write down ideas of like, okay, I can put if I put like a cracker on top of a, let's say a mouse keyboard or something, and then they'll peck at the mouse keyboard and maybe they'll end up like typing something. Mm. And so that could be like an idea or a half an idea. Right. And then I had what's, I think an idea really is just connecting two things that haven't been connected before. And so I had already been playing with posters, like fun tab posters, like, that you, we see on the street. And so my brain just made a connection. Okay, what if I made a poster for the pigeons and I just had them interact with the poster by putting a cracker or peanut butter on each tab? And that's how the idea happened, really. And so I have that on my notebook and um, I get excited because, and that's like a really exciting feeling to have an idea and kind of know how it could be executed because oftentimes I'll have an idea, but like the execution of the production part is kind of daunting. So that was the idea. I'm gonna put, make a poster, put peanut butter on it. So pigeons go to it and interact with it. And uh, I thought maybe if I loosen the tab enough when they bite, it'll come off. And so the next idea was I had to like say, what's gonna be on the poster? And I forget what the options were, but um, you know, a lot of these posters that we see on the street are like, are you sick and tired of uh, blank or um, do you want this? Or so I was like, what's a funny thing for a bird to want to engage with? It's just like, are you tired of being a bird? And so it just kind of happens. Um, I, you don't know where these ideas come from. You just like, thank God that they came and write them down. And, and uh, the next day, I think I went out and, and did, I shot it. It only took like an hour to shoot. So. And these, um, um, and these pigeons obligingly came, they, they were good to work with. Yeah, they're wonderful. And uh, yeah, you don't even have to pay them. They're huh. not SAG actors. So um, yeah, they're awesome. And Laura. so I keep making pigeon videos. So that one worked. That video worked. You know, people liked it. It was fun. I enjoyed making it. I was like kind of happy to have made it. And so I keep making pigeon videos. I even just posted one like an hour ago. Um, Laura just asked, um, what are the reactions of people passing by when you're filming these pigeons? Yeah, so that's something that, uh, you know, you kind of have to deal with when you're doing something a little bit strange in public. Um, what's funny about Chinatown is that people are, there's so many characters and people doing crazy stuff um, in Chinatown already that it wasn't really, no one really asked me. Like there was a guy next to me on the bench that was just like reading a book and not doing anything, uh, not even asking me a question. So, um, yeah, going out in public and shooting stuff like this is, it's like, oh, I don't want to have to like rationalize or explain to someone why I'm doing this. Um, uh, especially while I'm trying to get a shot, but you know, it's part of like, say, fuck it. Like 
no one cares. Uh, just get the shot and get out of there. Yeah. Or just hang out. And I don't really like to talk to people while I'm making stuff. And that's, but like, you can always meet people in the, in the process too. For sure. Um, you were talking about <clears throat> thinking about pigeons and then thinking about different sort of sketching out different ideas or different possibilities and the different stages. And there was a question earlier from Anna um, asking you um, about your creative process. Um, and Anna says, especially when working for clients, but I think it'd be nice to hear it broadly as well. Um, Anna's asking, do you sketch your ideas or do you just experiment during the production? Love from Spain. Um, hi. I, uh, yeah, it's something I think about constantly. It's like, first of all, I don't think you can just decide to have an idea. Uh, I tr Believe me, I try all the time just to try to have an idea. Um, but what I've found that is like, if I put myself, I, I recognize pa patterns in the creative process where I kind of remember where I had all my good ideas and I try to recreate the circumstance and um, the environment in which that idea came from. So mm -hmm. for me, I know that I, a lot of good ideas come after I slept like really well. Mm -hmm. um a lot of good ideas also come after like i go exercise or swim or do something cardiovascular like exert energy in some other place and then come back and my mind is relaxed and so my creative process begins by, by trying to put myself in a position to where i can potentially have a creative idea and so that's kind of a like physical situation where i slept well i uh I maybe got some exercise or went for a walk and uh, maybe, you know, I love to eat food, but having a big meal and then trying to think doesn't really work out that well. So um, that's the first most, actually, I think that's the most important thing is to put yourself in a situation where a good idea could happen. And then um, the idea ideation process comes with me. Um, sometimes I'll just sit down and kind of like think about, some insights that I've had or things that I want to potentially create an idea around. Um, but oftentimes I have to tell myself, okay, you're not leaving or you're not stopping work until you have 10 ideas. So for me, it's important to have 10 ideas. You know, I gave myself the brief to have like 10 ideas a day. And so like here, I have my sketchbooks. Oh, show, sure, show, sure, show. Sure. I have all my sketchbooks here. And uh, so and then this is something that I learned from, I forget who, but anyways, I create a grid of 10 cells. And so each page and I date it. So for example, this was 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, this was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll have, I'll put down ideas. And so it's me kind of pondering things that uh i think could potentially be more fun or be more entertaining um so i guess i'll just uh for example you know ring lights i think a lot of people are maybe using a ring light i have a window here but uh, my girlfriend uses a ring light for like zoom calls mm -hmm. and i know a lot of other people do and i was so I was just kind of thinking about ring lights for like a, a few minutes and i was like what could you do with a ring light that's unexpected and so this is an idea. I don't know if it's going to be good. It's basically using the ring light to like keep your lunch heated. Like this is warming up a pizza or pasta. I forget what it is. But basically that was the idea. Okay. What if you use your ring light just to keep your lunch warm uh, during uh, while working? I don't know. That's not a, maybe a great idea, but it's an idea. And the fact that I wrote it down is um, I'm happy with like that. I just put an idea down on paper. I can't really, I don't, I don't think I work, I'm not my best when I'm just waiting to put down a great idea. If I'm just continuing to put down even bad ideas, that's helpful to me. Right. Um, that's really good to see. And that, and that grid is um, basically just to force yourself to do 10 things a day. Is that it? Yeah. So it's like, okay. I, write, I put a grid of 10 uh, empty boxes and, you know, I'm there thinking about the first one and then... 30 or 45 minutes go down. I haven't written one. I feel the pressure. Like, I oh, fuck, I have 10 and I'm hungry. Like I, I want to go outside or just, so like, I'll just 
force it myself to write down a bad idea, then another bad idea. And then I'm always surprised on where I'm at after writing down a couple bad ideas. Right. I say bad ideas because maybe they're not bad, but they're not great. They're not like worth making really necessarily, but there may be an insight that comes from the thinking that can lead to another idea. Um, a a follow-up question to that last one uh, is from uh, Genevieve, which is, how do you manage to renew your content ideas and how do you keep your style without being repetitive? Yeah, well, I think secretly I am a little bit repetitive or, you know, I do pigeon videos. I do another pigeon video. I do another pigeon video. I try not to make them like the exact same. Yeah. Um, well, you've got your themes, haven't you? You've got your... Yeah, I have themes. I mean, I think that's important. It's hard to rock, really... Hot dogs, long <laughs> yeah. dogs, llamas, feet, yeah. small hands. <laughs> yeah exactly all those are kind of like funny objects like hot dogs i think are funny so like sometimes i'll just think of 10 ideas about hot dogs um so i mean i know that my audience don't, don't want us uh, are not there to see the same thing over and over again and so that's kind of like a starting point encouraging me to do something yeah. a little bit different each time yeah. and then i personally don't want to make the same thing over and over again so um, it keeps it more interesting. And then, yeah, I mean, that's where I'm often stuck. My creative block comes from me not knowing what to do next and not and knowing that I can't really, I don't really want to repeat myself. And so that's a real uh, struggle, really. It's like, what can I do next? I don't have any ideas. Um, I haven't posted. Maybe there's the pressure to post, which I, I know is unhealthy, but it exists. Mm-hmm. Um and uh yeah you honestly just have to put in the work in the notebook um go take a break go walk outside maybe revisit an, a bad idea and see how you can make it maybe be good and so the benefit of having all these um you know ideas written in a notebook is that you can go and uh back to something you haven't finished yet and so yeah. usually that's a good place to start somewhere where you left off um yeah that's great to i i i think that's um i think that's very very good advice um and when it comes to executing so that's the idea part um a question from tommy is what tools do you use to create with um and are you self-taught stuff these sneakily ask two questions in one. Oh yeah um yeah so my main creative tools are you know the notebook and then photoshop and after effects I'd say these are like the, I don't really use Illustrator or Premiere that much. Those mm-hmm. are the two things that I use. And uh, I learned all of it on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Like I'll like um, say, okay, I need, like one day I learned how to do green screen on After Effects. It was like, oh, I can take the green color out of a footage that I downloaded from YouTube. And like, that's green. It was like key, called King. And so, um, you know, oftentimes I've, try to come up with an idea around a new skill or a new tool that I've learned, um, which the idea, maybe I'll, it's good for learning the tool, but I, the idea might not be great. Um, but so usually I'll learn something on After Effects or Photoshop on YouTube because I need to know how to make something that I wanna make. For, there's an idea that I need to know how to make because, um, or, you know, you can, maybe ask a friend who's an expert on in After Effects, but YouTube is amazing, really. It is, it yeah. is. Um, I'm, I know we haven't got too much time left and I'd really love to turn to the last course, which is um, um, the next the next meal part, which is um, you, it's something um, I've invited you to pick something you've seen recently done by someone else that's inspiring to you about what, creati- what creativity can and should be. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if you chose anything. Yeah, um, I guess what I chose wasn't isn't really recent, but it is something that's kind of always with me, and that's something is something that inspired me as early on. Mm-hmm. And so the first one is um, Jackass, the movie, mm-hmm. or Jackass, the TV show, like all of Jackass, um, because when I was a kid and that came out, that gave me permission to know that I can be an adult and I can do crazy shit and I can like have just for the pure sake of fun and humor do wild out there stuff and then you know I turned 
I was watching it and I may have watched it with my parents and they're laughing like this can make anyone entertain anyone this silly ridiculous stuff and so like that made me get outside have a camera start pulling pranks doing crazy stuff with my friends in the neighborhood um and so to and I think my other examples are kind of like this is that uh being an adult and doing silly stuff can be a career mm. um obviously like design and art direction have been, is, are a lot of what I do. Um, and I like, that does interest me. And I study graphic design. Um, but the spirit of doing, having an idea that is, there's no reason to do it other than that. It's going to be fun and silly and entertaining potentially um, is like all the permission that I need, um, even as like a 32 year old adult. Yeah. 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 Very inspiring. And what about brands? There've been, um, a lot of questions about, um, brands, about, um, um, about, um, how you, how, how you think it, do you use your Instagram as effectively a billboard for yourself to get brand work? Is that, is that how, is that how it goes? Yeah, I mean, it turns out that way. I don't, I don't ever really post an idea with the um, intention of hoping like a brand sees this and will commission me to do something similar for them or just get their attention so they know that I'm around and can do work and get paid to do work. Um, I think it's just a result of continually posting idea ideas. Um, and some of them working and building an audience and kind of, I'd really treat my Instagram account as like a playground or a public sketchbook for ideas. And so some, mm -hmm. some things will be, will not really be interesting to people. Some things will like go viral. And I think uh, most brands want similar attention for their work. And so they'll like ask me to, as a result of seeing these type of things work and then liking the things that I make um, and the more visibility it gets, the more uh, opportunities that come. I mean, it's like it, uh, brands want a video, a viral video too. And so, yeah. and I'm fortunate to have worked in advertising and studied design. So I kind of um, familiar with creating a piece of communication, not just something that's silly, but also works within a brand strategy and a, uh, brand book and you know makes sense for the company to invest in and publish for their own brand um, channel because tom asked the question about is is it hard switching from creative work for yourself for fun for creating for clients and are there now more rules and boundaries but i guess you grew up through that world so you know that you know that world don't you yeah i mean um part of the joy of the creative process is creative problem solving and so oftentimes brands you know, as an advertiser or an agency, it's basically the creative problem solvers. And so I, let's say a company has a shoe, um, what makes this shoe interesting and how can we separate ourselves and um, get engagement um, for this uh, within a, an image or a video showing off this shoe. So that's the problem. Like how do, how can we get people to care about this shoe? Um, I'm just random product, but uh then it's like, okay, let me see it. And then I go to my sketchbook and instead of thinking about a pigeon, I'm thinking about a shoe. And I'm also thinking about like where the brand values and these other constraints, but um, I'm going into my notebook for coming up with a concept for a brand, just like I would come up with for myself. Like I'm trying to like keep yeah. it, my brain a little loose, come, trying to make connections that haven't been made before. And um you know, putting a deck together and sharing my ideas with the client. Of course, there's going to be, um, there's a lot more meetings involved and um, there are going to be problems with, you know, in production, not, you can't show that logo or there's like a lot of constraints in the editing process, but that's do they fine. Ever, um, I, do brands ever um, sort of question you about your low, the lo-fi nature of your production? Do they want something a little bit slicker sometimes? Sometimes. I <laughs> I remember doing a project early on for uh, a hotel company and it was like with the, anyways, it was, uh, 
I made something in 2D and because that's only know I only knew how to make some animate something in 2D. And then like later, like towards the end of the project, they're like, oh, can we actually like get that object in 3D? Like, can you make that a little bit more polished? And I like freaked out. I was like, I don't know. Like I was just on the phone. I was like, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I was just completely honest with them. So um yeah, I do encounter that sometimes where they do need a little bit more polish, but um, fortunately, I'm in a place where people are familiar with my work and understand yeah. that I am going to give them something. Yeah, I can give them something like a f- photograph with nice lighting and whatnot. And now I have the resources and uh, production partners who can um, make a higher production piece of content. Um, but I think one of the reasons why I continually publish my own work is not only because I enjoy entertaining people, because it's just a friendly reminder to people out in the world that this is what I like making. This is what I make. Um, And so hoping when brands come to me, they understand that and they expect the same type of treatment for their work. Um, I know you were going to show as part of your main course. I think I skipped over it, the um, Netflix piece, weren't you? Mm -hmm. I know. I wonder if yeah. it'd be good to sh- if we could um, flick back to that, and I wonder if it'd be good to show that as a good example of um, you and your style working for that brand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so this is kind of a perfect example of an independent project that becomes a client project where, um, you know, it started with the insight that I had where I was watching Netflix. You go to this home screen that we always see with these avatars of like who's watching. And there are these funny faces that Netflix has designed. And um, I think we've all seen them or like I've seen it a million times. And then finally one day I was like, wait. Uh, that's kind of a strange design. I mean, it's funny. I think it's fun and playful, but it, like, how can I show that this is a odd face that they decided to design for their avatar? And so I said, like, okay, what if my, what if someone actually looked like that? And so that was an idea for a personal post, which was to change someone's face. In this case, a family of faces into the, the family of icons and avatars that are on their Netflix account. Um, so I just made that video that you saw there and I posted it. Um, it got a lot of engagement and then Netflix, um, found out about it and, uh, they reached out and said, Hey, we would love to post this. Um, and they did, I was like, okay, great. And then they ended up asking me, Hey, can you make some more stuff like this? And so it tur- that be- Netflix becomes a client. And so I, I, they start commissioning content for me. We even made a, uh, face filter that turns your face into the avatar and so we took that one idea and like kind of pushed it further with the client and so that's a good example of me treating my instagram account as like a kind of a playground public sketchbook or a playground for ideas where um anyone can come in like just be a passive viewer or if you're a brand and you enjoy and you think your audience will also enjoy that type of work um you can reach out to me and uh you know, if it fits, um, we can start making that kind of content together for uh, the brands. Fantastic. And, and and they also, you know, and they came to you and they asked and they commissioned you. Um, mm-hmm. There was an, an, a very early question um, from Simi, actually, um, about that, because sometimes people don't, right? They, um, Simi said, love your content. How do you deal with other outlets or creatives or meme pages, or I would say even sometimes businesses mm-hmm. stealing your content and not crediting it? How do you deal with that? Yeah, um, that's a funny one because it does happen a lot. And um, I think I'm dealing better with it now. At first, it was kind of felt really, really violating to, you know, make something and see someone else profit off of it. Um, You know, if a brand uses it for uh, to sell their own product, that happens. Um, But I have to kind of remind myself that at least people want to steal this stuff. Like I could be worse. It could be like, I make 
content that's not interesting at all and no one's stealing my stuff. So first of all, I guess I'll, I could take it as a compliment, right? Yeah. And um, lucky that pe- it's actually worth stealing. So that's good. And then, uh, you know, I've tried to, you know, I email people like me a couple of years ago. I was like, hey, I'm going to call my lawyer. Even, even when I didn't have a lawyer, uh, I was going to, you know, contacts like i looked up the ceo of a brand and emailed them say hey you're social like i was going crazy like when this first started happening to me i never really posted public about it i did do one time i did one thing publicly um well first of all i don't think my audience is really interested in me complaining about another company stealing my work and so i don't really talk about it public publicly but I did do it one time with Burger King when they took an idea for an Instagram ad and they were, it was going everywhere. And then people DM'd me this thing that Burger King was taking from my account. Um, and then I had, uh, I was like, oh, I think I have the perfect vengeance for this. And so I ended up like doing this thing where I drew a penis and I separated into separate photos and I tagged Burger King. So if you go to the Burger King account, there's this big dick that's drawn on their tag section. And yeah, that was kind of petty. It's stupid. But I felt like, okay, I'm not going to like, I just kind of like, I want to get back at them in a creative way. And so that was the kind of the only time I really went public with something. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I did a couple other times, but <laughs> I think it's really the best vengeance is to be creative. So, yeah, you know, I'm just lucky that people are like the work enough to even contemplate stealing it. And so, um, and then I found that my energy is used um, better if I'm creating new work rather than chasing down people who are taking old work. And so I know it's like a very Zen approach, but it's really something that I really I'm agree a, with that. I really I, uh, it's uh, it's easy to say. Sometimes hard to do when you're pissed off, but um, <laughs> and it's like. Have, you have to be, especially as a creative, like energy is so important in terms of like, that's the source of being creative is having that energy throughout the day. And so if I spend that chasing down someone who took something that's taking away energy from producing new work. So I'd rather focus on that. Great. I'm going to, um, a couple of last questions just to wind it up. One from uh, Ali and one from uh, Elizabeth, um, which are similar questions. Ali's uh asking, are there any creators? I mean, you talked about Jackass, um, but Ali's asking, are there any creators out, the, out there that inspire you? And Elizabeth's asking, are there any uh, resources you engage with for creators wanting to make brilliant ideas or problem solve? So any yeah, sort of resources or inspirations for you? Who are they? Yeah. For me, like creative, the creators that I get inspired by aren't necessarily doing similar work to me and that they're mm-hmm. doing like creative work that I'm jealous of. Um, but they're creating content that I love and just want more of. And so for me, someone like that is uh, someone like New York Nico um, mm-hmm. is an account in New York Nico, who is a filmmaker. Um, he kind of does a lot of things, but he, you know, he's from New York, lives in New York, and he documents the city and the characters around it and the stories around the city. So he's really tapped into um, his community. He's helping out businesses. He's kind of shining light on people who may not have the visibility on social media. Anyways, um, I just love, you know, I don't live in New York, but I almost feel like I live there just following him. And so the value I get from him, his account, his account is um, inspiring and, you know, that's someone I look up to in terms of content that I'm not making, but I'm, I really admire. Fantastic. Um, listen, this has been, um, Pablo, it's been so great to, oh, and I, you haven't even had your breakfast burrito. Of course, that Pablo's, oh, like, I have a breakfast Pablo's burrito over here. in San Francisco. He loves burrito. It is breakfast time. How uh, appetizing does that look? Not, not you know, people don't, people don't know this, but I moved to San Francisco just for burritos. Oh, there you go. And, and, and burritos play a role in your work as well, don't they? Yeah, I did. Uh, well, I work with Chipotle sometimes. Uh-huh. Um, I say I think they make a good burrito. Um, <laughs> yeah, do do burritos show up in my work? I forget. Maybe not. Obviously not. Obviously, I got that wrong. Eventually, you know, I'm still thinking about it, but maybe okay. maybe they will. I mean, um, thanks to um, thanks 
Pablo, this has been absolutely fantastic. It's just very inspiring and very articulate. And um, if there's anyone here who's been watching who isn't going to pick up their phone, turn to Photoshop, turn to After Effects and just mm -hmm. try some stuff, I'll be really surprised because I'm going to I'm going to do that now. Um, so, yeah, sh show really me. Really fantastic. Um, if you um, just, and to everyone watching, if you want to see this again, because uh, I think I mean, this has been really dense with fantastic um, inspiration and advice. Um, or you know someone who wanted to see it and missed it, this is going to be up uh, on DNAD site um, in within the next week. And um, don't forget um, that next month it's going to be Paloma Strelitz. We're having dinner with Paloma Strelitz, the uh, uh, Turner, Turner Prize winning architect and one of the co-founders of Assemble and now um, a strategist and uh, thinker. Uh, and she's really fantastic. So I'd just like to wrap up by saying um, thanks to Felix Townsend, who did our wonderful, playful foodie identity and uh, Pablo with his um, burrito, that's uh, food, Felix did that. Um, thanks to Yuri Suzuki, uh, my Pentagram partner and his team for their brilliant theme tune made with um, knives and forks and pots and pans. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming to dinner with Pablo uh, and for all the questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of them. Uh, just a crazy amount of questions actually. And most of all, thanks to uh, the brilliant Pablo Rocha. Thank you.